Um, I just want to take a minute and talk about how skeletal muscle gets its ATP. Um, and it's not dramatically different than the stories we've told way back in the metabolism chapter. But basically, what skeletal muscle uses for contraction is ATP, and we use it for cross-bridge cycling, of course. It's also used during the action potential that precedes cross-bridge cycling, and then re remember that we also need to use it to pump calcium back into the SR um, to relax. So really, it's ATP that we are going to be using. But um, skeletal muscle needs a ton of ATP, and obtaining it from food is relatively slow, the whole absorption and transport and moving it into the cell. So the deal is, since skeletal muscle is your emergency response tissue that'll keep you from getting hit by a bus or eaten by a tiger, um, we have to make sure that we also have, we always have some reserves um, of either nutrients or ATP so that we can actually always contract a skeletal muscle, even if I haven't eaten for hours. So several reserves exist so that we don't have to, for instance, a bus is coming at me, try to eat a, a Mars bar and like wait for it to hit my skeletal muscles. No, we'd be dead. So um, what are the reserves that exist, the sources of energy for muscle contraction? Well, the first thing is, <clears throat> remember, <clears throat> before we actually even get into this, that the last time you did a cross bridge, you actually left this ATP, this myosin head, in the high energy position. You kind of already paid for the first cross bridge you're going to get the next time you contract. So the myosin head is left in the high energy position ready for a power stroke. So when it goes, you kind of get the first cross bridge formation for free and the first power stroke for free, right? Not really free, you just paid for it last time. Okay, and then um, the next thing is that I have kind of an easy way to get ATP back into a ADP back into ATP. And that is that inside a skeletal muscle cell, we actually have this chemical called creatine phosphate and an enzyme that is necessary to take the phosphate off of creatine and put it back on ADP to make more ATP, which admittedly is going to be faster than doing all of this, right? So creatine phosphate plus ADP is going to make it back into ATP. The enzyme that's needed to do that is called CK or CPK, creatine kinase or creatine phosphokinase. And um, how long will this work? Well, it depends on you, but generally speaking, this creatine phosphate, the amount of it that you have is only available for about a minute at a brisk walk or about six seconds of sprinting, which would be pretty useful to get you away from a tiger or a bus, right? Now, um, interestingly, if you damage your skeletal muscle, one of the ways that you can damage, you know that you've damaged your skeletal muscle, is that creatine um, phosphate, uh, CPK, sorry, will spill out into the extracellular fluid and circulate in your bloodstream. Um, cardiac muscle also has CPK. It's cardiac CPK or cardiac CK. And that's one of the ways that they actually diagnose whether you had a heart attack is whether that's in the bloodstream. But that's cardiac muscle. Okay. The other thing is that remember that we always have a little bit of oxygen that's kind of stored on the myoglobin. So you start exercising. Do you have to wait for your cardiovascular and respiratory system to deliver adequate amounts of oxygen for your muscle to actually do cellular respiration? No, because we always have a little bit of it stored in here. So there's a small qu quantity of oxygen that's bound to my myoglobin. So aerobic cellular respiration can actually start and get going even before the cardiovascular and the respiratory systems catch up. Um, but then, what about the glucose that I need? Well, remember that a skeletal muscle has its own piggy bank of glycogen. So I have oxygen stored, and I have glycogen stored, and I've got boatloads of mitochondria in most cells, not all of them. Um, so I'm going to break down the glycogen. This is the major source for nutrients at the beginning of exercise, maybe first five, 10 minutes. So where are we now? We're like 11 minutes in, okay, to exercising. 
Um, so I'm going to break down glycogen. I'm going to use the oxygen that I have. I'm going to start aerobic cellular respiration all the way through oxfos, at least in some cells. And then um, I'm like 11 minutes in or so. Hopefully my cardiovascular and respiratory system have caught up and now I'm actually delivering blood glucose and delivering blood oxygen. And that, depending on how much I have stored and everything, could last me for like the next 30 minutes. Okay, so now I'm 41-ish minutes in. Now, after that, usually people will have run out of blood glucose then, depending on whether you're carb loaded. Um, then what's going to happen is your skeletal muscles are primarily going to start burning fatty acids. Okay, either from dietary fatty acids in your bloodstream or you could actually start burning your own fat. Now, this does not mean that you have to work out for 40 something minutes in order to burn any fat. It means you have to work out for 40 something minutes for this cell to switch to burning fatty acids. But other cells, if you had taken in fewer nutrients than you'd wiggled over the course of the day, then other cells can actually switch to fatty acids sooner. So you do not have to work out 40 minutes before you get any fat burning, just before this cell, because it's got so many stores, before this cell switches to fat burning. So um, now this is the same story that you've learned before. Glycogen gets broken down to glucose via glycogenolysis. Glucose gets broken down to pyruvate and ATP via glycolysis. Then if you have oxygen, you do, uh, if you have oxygen, you do, aerobic respiration and you generate CO2 and H2O and lots of ATP. But um, skeletal muscle can also take this and generate a little bit of ATP. It's kind of like pushing it back through glycolysis again. I won't ask you to do it in detail. But one of the things that skeletal muscle can do that not all tissues can do is that it can take this step and it can actually um, generate lactate or lactic acid and a little bit of ATP if you do not have oxygen to go through the rest of aerobic cellular respiration. So you can generate ATP, not very much of it, and you'll also generate a byproduct called lactic acid or lactate. And lactate will eventually cause your muscle to completely kind of wear out. It's not the cause of muscle soreness. It was thought it was, but it's not the cause of muscle soreness. So a couple of notes about this. What requires oxygen, what doesn't? This part, glycogen to glucose, does not require oxygen. Glycolysis does not require oxygen. Anaerobic respiration that you're seeing here does not require oxygen, produces a little bit of ATP. Now, fatigue occurs when you do this. It's due to lack of ATP to keep going because you're just basically wiggling more than you're generating ATP. And then the buildup of lactic acid seems to, last time I read, um, cause problems with maintaining sarcomere contraction and cross bridges. Although we will have to look into that a little further because the research changes almost every time I read, I read it. But one of the things that they have figured out is that it is not a major cause of muscle soreness, although quite often muscles are sore when there's lactic acid. However, they have generated some experiments in the lab in which they wear out a muscle but suffuse it with oxygen and it's still sore and there's no lactic acid. So um, then Krebs and Oxfos, right? Those both require oxygen and they produce far more ATP, okay? So how about recovering from muscle activity? After I have used this muscle, the things that I need to do is I need to put everything back, all of those stores, so that the next time a bus tries to hit me, I will have easy access to these stores. So when I finish contracting the skeletal muscle, I'm not finished using oxygen or nutrients or ATP. I've got to put everything back. So for that reason, skeletal muscle metabolism stays high even after the muscle is finished contracting. So for recovering from muscle activity, first thing is your respiratory and cardiovascular system need to keep going for quite a while after you stopped exercising. Heart rate and respiration don't go down immediately, and they could. Um, because I need to put the oxygen back onto the myoglobin. I also, of course, need to replace it back onto the hemoglobin. And then I also need to take creatine um, and make it back into creatine phosphate so they'll have easy access to doing that. I use ATP to do that. 
I take the phosphate from ATP and put it on creatine phosphate so that the next time I need to quickly phosphorylate ADP so that I can use it, I will have access to that. So that requires ATP for a while. The lactic acid um, that I generate, um, that has to be oxidized back to glucose by the liver. So lactic acid gets dumped into the bloodstream and then you actually send it to the liver um, and it will make it back into glucose, but it requires oxygen to do that. So again, oxygen needs are still pretty high. Um, and then the glycogen that I had stored in here, I have to put it back. So I've got to actually use glucose and actually make um, glucose into glycogen when I'm not using my muscles. So the nutrients and the energy and the oxygen are therefore required even after the muscle activity stops. They call this repaying the oxygen debt, but it's not just oxygen debt. It's oxygen, it's nutrients, right? Um, and it's, uh, well, oxygen and nutrients primarily. Um, so this is repla replacing creatine phosphate, glycogen, all of those things. And then, of course, um, skeletal muscle contraction, because what you're doing is you're taking chemical energy and converting it into mechanical energy. It tends to be very inefficient. You generate a lot of heat as a byproduct. And then, of course, you have to use your metabolism to cool your body down. So the body also generally has to cool be cooled off after muscle activity, which is energetically expensive. So of the energy that is released as glucose is broken down inside a skeletal muscle, only about 40% of it gets used for muscle contraction. The rest of it is released as heat. And so skeletal muscle contraction tends to really heat up the body and then you have to cool it back down. This is why shivering is really, really effective at heating up your body because that muscle contraction, yes, is occurring, but you're also generating heat as a byproduct. Okay.